All righty, welcome everybody and good evening. My name is Mike Friedlander. I think I know most or at least a lot of you in the audience. I just want to say how grateful we are for all of you coming out to share a spring evening with us. So hopefully it's been fun and it will continue to be fun. Uh, what we're going to do this evening here is have a few of us give brief talks about some aspect of brain. And we have a central theme for this tonight, as you can see, called the electric brain, which will permeate all four uh, presentations. And just by way of reminder, this is part of something called Brain Awareness Week. <clears throat> Brain Awareness Week is sponsored by an organization called the Dana Brain Alliance or Dana Brain Foundation and the Society for Neuroscience. And the goal of Brain Awareness Week is just what it says, to make us all aware of our brains. And hopefully everybody in this room has at least some curiosity about that, and that's why you're here. So when you leave, hopefully you'll be a little more aware of some of the things going on in, in our brains. Um, so as part of that, we've done this brain school, as we call it, for a decade now. And it's been a lot of fun. We've done it different ways. A couple times we did it all week. But in reality, in the spring, asking people to come four or five nights, we realized that wasn't really that good an idea. So we've done a bit of a compression, and we're doing this in one evening. We've also had our students go out to the schools in the Roanoke area, the middle schools and high schools, and give presentations to students and their teachers about various cool brain facts. And apparently, I just uh, heard today, a lot of that went really well. So we're really glad to be reaching out to the community, as well as bringing all of you here. For those who are intrepid enough after these talks to want to see some stuff, we're going to have a little tour after through this building, through some of the major facilities for brain research that you're more than welcome to stay for. If you don't, you don't want to stay for it, that's fine. But we'd be glad to show you around, OK? So without further ado, we're going to dive into it. I'm, I'm up first. That's me. <clears throat> and. Uh, this is the title, The Electric Brain. What's listed underneath is the uh, times for the talks and so forth. So you have me first. So let me just start with what I want to talk about. So <clears throat> I've drawn a lightning bolt here. That's on average about 300 million volts to ground, a single lightning bolt, and uh, about 30,000 amps of electric current and about a billion watts of power. For comparison purposes, our brains run on about 12 watts of power, not quite a lightning bolt. And as a matter of fact, um, runs on less power than a 40-watt light bulb, but does a lot more. And these little blippy lines here, each one of those is a nerve impulse, or what's called an action potential, that a nerve cell or a neuron generates. And you can see they're about a tenth of a volt, about a thousandth of an amp. And I don't know how many decimals that is, but a lot of zeros, 0 0.2, 0 0.002 watts. So just to keep things in perspective, there is electricity in our brain. But it's a different kind of electricity from what you get in the outlet. First of all, it's not AC or alternating current. You may know the electricity that comes through our walls for historical reasons runs at 60 hertz alternating. In some places, it's 50 hertz, like in most of Europe. Turns out that's a very unfortunate selection of a frequency because it's really good at doing something to membranes inside nerve cells, which is called depolarization. And that's why you get shocked or can get electrocuted by that kind of current. Direct current is less likely to do that. And I'll show you how that works in a, in a minute. So those are the basics, a little bit of comparisons about brains and other sources of electricity. So this is what I'd like to do in the next few minutes. What differentiates our brain from the rest of the body? How we metabolize things? How does our brain get energy? What do we use it for? What is a living battery? And what defines life? Which is always an interesting discussion, but I'll keep it to the cellular level. Uh, how does a nerve cell membrane behave like an electrical circuit? How do electrical signals get from one place to another? And I'll give an example at the end on how nature uses electricity in shocking ways. Okay, so that's what I want to do in a few minutes. So first of all, by the numbers, I, I decided instead of using uh, scientific notation, I do the zero thing because it's a little more dramatic here. So how many, how many nerve cells or neurons do we have in our brain? People argue about this, but kind of 80, 90 billion nerve cells. How many of the what are called supporting cells that we have in the brain? Pretty close to the same number. The people who study these and the people who study these get in arguments all the time. We have more neurons. We have more glial cells. I don't know. Big numbers, both pretty similar. And then how many of these things called synapses, where one nerve cell communicates with another one, do we have in the brain? Well, about 85 trillion. So those are the sites where what we call computation occurs or information is processed between networks of living nerve cells. And just those sheer numbers should tell you something. This is a picture of a neuron called a Purkinje cell. This is a, a glial cell. Here's a little bit 
of this neuron here and all these little things coming very close to it are forming synapses. And synapses come in two flavors. The most common one is called a chemical synapse where one nerve cell releases a chemical that binds a receptor on the next one causing activity. Here's a picture of that. And in the front side, you have all these little vesicles that contain chemicals that are released. This thing here is called a mitochondria. We'll hear more about those later for generating energy. And then we have these electrical synapses where one nerve cell talks to another directly by having electric current go from one to the other without having the chemical step in between. But for the most part, we talk about chemical synapses. In the human brain, they, they predominate. So the brain you already saw, I think, is a, is a privileged organ, if you will, in many respects, both in terms of power, its ability to compute information on a very, very small amount of energy usage. And part of that relates to this. So this is a picture of a human brain with the circulation. In this, uh, in this picture, the brain has been stripped away chemically, and all that's left is the circulation, the blood vessels that go into the brain. I, I show this to make the point how richly vascularized the brain is. And many of you probably heard this, even though the brain accounts for only 2% of our body mass, it uses 20% of the oxygen. So the brain is highly metabolically active, puts tremendous demands. And I'm sure you've all heard if the brain goes without oxygen for even a very short period of time, that's not a good thing. Unlike other parts of our body that can get by and, and metabolize without oxygen, at least for a while, the brain can't do that hardly at all. It needs oxygen constantly. And it's because of this very high metabolic demand. And for those of you who want to see a little bit of the detail, I'll just hit the high points here. The energy comes from a sugar, glucose, and that glucose that comes up in our blood vessels to the brain can either go directly into a nerve cell here and be taken up by a special molecule, or it can go through other cells called glial cells. This is an example of one called an astrocyte. And then it's changed to various other uh, uh, byproducts, and then that's transferred into the nerve cell. So the nerve cells are demanding lots of sugar, lots of glucose. They're also demanding, as I said, lots of oxygen. So the oxygen and the glucose together allow the process of what's called oxidative metabolism or aerobic metabolism to occur. And that's how brains get their energy. And all these little details here show this going on inside this uh, little organelle in a nerve cell I already mentioned called a mitochondrion. And ultimately, after all these chemical reactions occur and electrons are moved down chains and so forth and so on, you end up with this molecule right here called adenosine triphosphate, or ATP, often called the currency of energy in living cells. ATP is what the cells in your brain use for the energy to do the stuff that they have to do, basically. So that's, and that's what they need to get along with the oxygen. So here's a blown up picture of one of those mitochondrion sitting here, just a schematic. And here's a picture of the cell membrane from the nerve cell. And this just shows how the ATP is produced. And again, I won't go through all the details. I already mentioned that you make ATP. You get a lot of those molecules for a lot of energy. And down here is shown a chemical formula for the molecule ATP. Adenosine, it has a sugar molecule, and three what are called high energy phosphate groups. So the energy is in the chemical bonds of the phosphorus and the oxygen forming what are called phosphate groups. When you unleash that energy, that can be captured and used to drive energetically demanding processes in the cell. That's what your brain is doing at a very high rate all of the time. So let's get back to the electricity side of this for just a moment. So cells, including neurons in the brain, are really living batteries. And you can measure it, just like a battery in your car, you can clip onto the positive and negative pole. You can do the same thing with a living brain cell. You can put a, literally put a wire inside them or a little glass tube. There are all kinds of different ways to do this. And you can measure the difference, electrically speaking, in terms of a voltage drop from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. And what you always find is the inside of the cell is negative with respect to the outside of the cell. And that's because all that energy I just told you about, that ATP is working <clears throat> to actively run this machinery. This is a pump. It's a molecular pump that is pushing or pumping certain ions like sodium or potassium or calcium, whatever. In this case, it's sodium and potassium, pushing them against the gradient actually doing work to move them against the gradient and separate them. So you end up with a nerve cell that is bathed in fluid called your cerebral spinal fluid, 
like other fluids in the body, that has a lot of sodium and not too much potassium. Inside the nerve cell, you have much more potassium and not so much sodium. One of the things that can go wrong, if somebody were to give you an IV and mess around with the concentrations of the salts in there, the ions, and you ended up with a lot of potassium going into an IV, that's bad. That's, as a matter of fact, what they do in Texas and a few other states for the death penalty. After they anesthetize people, they inject them with a high concentration of potassium chloride. And the reason that works on the heart as well as the brain is in the membrane of the nerve cell, there are these ion channels that ions flow through. The potassium channels are allowing the potassium to go through pretty much at will while the nerve cell is resting. The sodium channels are closed. So if you change the force and put all this potassium outside the nerve cell and it goes rushing into the cell with all that positive charge, that kills the cell and ultimately it would kill the person or the animal, whatever it might be. So you want to keep your electrolytes balanced. One of the reasons when you go to the doctor and have labs done, you get your electrolytes checked. Sodium, potassium, chloride, calcium, uh, bicarbonate, etc. And so I make the analogy to this little battery and indeed, these molecular pumps for moving these ions use a lot of the power, but we've only learned in the last few years that it's only 10% of the power that the brain uses. If I was giving this talk five years ago, I would have reversed it. I would have said 90%. Most of the power and the energy I would have told you is for getting those ions balanced across the membrane, because every time you fire a nerve impulse, those ions move, and you got to get them back and use that energy. We now know something else is going on. And this is really pretty new, and it relates to the energy, and I'll, I'll come back to it in a second, but leave that thought in your mind about that other 90%. So here's the cell membrane, this dotted blue line. This is the fluid outside the cell. This is the inside of the cell. <clears throat> and in that membrane, you have these little green squiggly line things. These are molecules called phospholipids. And these are kind of fatty molecules, and they have those phosphate groups on them. And then this thing is what's called an ion channel. It's a protein that actually has an opening. It's called a pore that lets those ions move through from inside to outside and so forth, depending on what we call the driving force. So on the right side, I show what we call an equivalent electric circuit. For any of you remember, if you've had a class in physics and basic electricity, you may have seen these symbols. Uh, this stands for a battery right here. This stands for what's called a resistor. And this is a capacitor. The properties of those capacitors are like sponges. They will hold a lot of charge on them, and then they can release it all of a sudden. But the charges don't actually go through the capacitor. They build up on one side and create an energy force and push the charges off the other side. That's how a capacitor works, an electrical circuit, just that way in a membrane and a brain cell. These phospholipids act like, act like capacitors. A sodium ion cannot go through a bunch of phospholipids because it has an electrical charge and they're neutral. They wouldn't allow it to happen. A sodium ion could go through a channel or a pore if it's the right channel. So what happens in terms of electrical signaling is you have what's called capacitative currents where charge builds up. And then you have what we call ionic currents where charges and ions actually go through pores. So this is equal to this, and this is equal to this. And the battery, of course, is what I already told you. So, Think of a living nerve cell as a battery with electrical elements in. They're not made of metal and silicon and so forth. It's made of living biological material, but it behaves just that way. And that allows us to understand and study them. A little cuter picture of a neuronal cell membrane on the top. Here's your phospholipids, the red and yellow things. Here's one of these ion, ion channels that I mentioned before and some other cool molecules that are in there. So this is a model of the nerve cell membrane. What I highlighted on the bottom here is one particular type of these ion channels, the resistor, that has a certain amount of resistance to the flow of positive char charge. And by the way, current is the movement of positive charge. A lot of us, I think, tend to think about wires and out there in the, the man-made world of thinking of electrons moving through wires, and electrons are negative, and that's true, they do. But we, by convention, we talk about the flow of current as the direction of movement of positive charge. So if electrons are going that way, your current's going that way, the movement of positive charge. And in a living system like a nerve cell, those ions I mentioned, a lot of them, like sodium, potassium, have positive charges as they flow through these pores. So I want to highlight this one channel here. 
This is called a voltage-gated sodium ion channel. This is one of these. It's particularly good at letting sodium through under certain conditions. And the, the conditions are embedded in the name, voltage-gated. This molecule is so cool, it not only can decide to selectively let sodium go through mostly, it can also tell the cell, hey, the voltage has changed across the membrane, so it's time to open up or close. It's voltage sensitive. So as a protein, it has several amino acids strung together, and the way they're strung together makes them sensitive to an electric field across the membrane. So this voltage-gated sodium channel is what's largely responsible to create the nerve impulse, or what we call the action potential. And without those, you really don't have action potentials. So here's an example of a drawing, very schematized, of a nerve impulse, or what's called an action potential right here. Once again, the inside of the cell, we're measuring the voltage. This is in thousandths of a volt, millivolts, okay? And in this case, it starts off about minus 90, negative inside to outside. Something happens here. Some of those voltage-gated sodium channels open. Sodium flows in, brings positive charge in. That makes the inside less negative or more positive. And we call this depolarization. This is polarized. This is depolarized. The impulse, the voltage potential starts to run up all the way into the positive direction. It flips around. It actually goes positive inside compared to outside for a short period of time, thousandths of a second, maybe two thousandths of a second. And then it starts to come back down and other ion channels open up and then it kind of settles back in and comes back to baseline. This is a drawing at a little more compressed time scale to show a bunch of these impulses together. So nerve cells don't just do this. They don't just go bup, bup. They go brrr, brrr, brrr. Anybody want to hear that again? One more time. <laughs> brrr. And there are ones that very fast, and those that brrr, 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 slow, those that rapidly adapt or go brrr, and those that slowly adapt and go brrr, and keep firing. In another talk someday, I can tell you about what that means for detecting things in the world, like what you see, what you hear, what you feel, pain, etc. But those neurons, by just their membrane properties and their ion channels, can signal a lot of that information uh, to us. <clears throat> so that impulse begins. And then it runs down the process. This is called the axon. Once again, positive outside, negative inside. And it would spread, let's say, from here to here. Some nerve cells have this process called the axon surrounded by fatty layers <coughs> called myelin. This is a picture of the myelin wrapping around the axon of the nerve cell. And this is a picture using fluorescence microscopy with different colors to show where different molecules are. Every place there's a break in the myelin, what's called a node right here, a node of Ranvier. And these green ones show voltage-gated sodium channels, the things I told you about before that generate the nerve impulse or the action potential. The cool thing about this is, instead of the nerve impulse having to move smoothly down here, it can jump from node to node to node, so it means it conducts faster. If you want to get impulses from your toe to your spinal cord to your brain fast or vice versa or in the brain, you have two choices. You can make big, fat axons on your cells. They'll send the impulse faster, or you can wrap them in myelin. The problem with big, fat axons is you'd have to have you know, a spinal cord as wide as this room to accomplish what you need. So the way nature solved that problem is making myelin and having these rapid jumping conducting nerve impulses. And uh, if I can make this little thing run, you can just see a little cartoon of that, I think. So you see the sodium ions rushing in the next node of the action potential, the linal impulse, and it jumps to the next one. That's it, that wasn't really very <laughs> elaborate, I'm sorry, but you know, I just had to do that. Well, what happens when nature gets mad at a voltage-gated sodium channel? That's what happens. Anybody eat sushi? Raise your hand if you like sushi. I do. Anybody ever had real sushi? Been to Japan and had pufferfish sushi? So you know what I'm talking about. If you're a real sushi chef, you learn how to make this just right. When you clean the fish, you don't want parts of the ovaries or part of the liver to get into the food because it's full of a poison, a toxin called TTX or tetrodotoxin. If you're a really good sushi chef, you actually leave a little bit in. And the person eating the sushi gets a little tingle under their tongue. And that's good. If you get too much of a tingle, 
that's bad. And you can see the picture there. So that's a picture of the molecule. There's the fish, tetrodotoxin, TTX. And while it's a natural occurring toxin, and it binds to the voltage-gated sodium channel to stop action potential, so you can't do the things you need to do when you send nerve impulses, it's also a powerful tool for researchers in brain research and neuroscience. And we may or may not, from Matt, hear about any tetrodotoxin. I don't know, but we could hear about that <clears throat> a little bit later. So these, these tools can be used. So now, back to wrap up about the energy. I told you, hold on to that thought about where all the energy goes. This is where it goes. We now know this. 90% of the energy is used by the brain right here. Here's a bunch of neurons. These are where they talk to each other at synapses. These particular synapses, these are called presynaptic terminals. These are the places where the chemical neurotransmitter is released in these little vesicles. Each one of these little vesicles, here's a blow up of one cartoon fashion here, loads itself up with chemicals called neurotransmitter. To do that, it needs to derive energy from a pump, another pump using ATP, but this pump is what's called a proton pump. It's pumping hydrogen ions into the vesicle. And that's the energy, the ATP, that goes into that. And why is that happening? Well, all why questions in biology are hard. I don't know why, I didn't build it. You know, we have our ideas. And one idea that a lot of us have had is that the brain needs to be ready to fire all the time, sleeping, awake, et cetera. And you're recycling those vesicles and filling them constantly. Those synapses are ready to go. When you go to sleep, you're burning just as much energy as when you're awake. If you stop the electrical activity in the brain, all those nerve impulses I was talking about, you're still burning almost as much energy because of this. What's happening locally at the synapses to keep them primed and ready to go by running these pumps? Okay, I'm gonna end up with nature. Nature strikes back with electricity. This is one of my dear friends, a torpedo, Torpedo Californica. This is another one of my dear friends, Astroscopus, the stargazer. Each of these critters have done something really amazing. They have taken synapses and modified them, not to process information or to make a movement, but to deliver an electric shock. So this is the electric torpedo. What they've done is take muscle cells and they stack them up on top of each other. So if you remember way back from introductory physics, if you put a bunch of batteries in series with each other, one connected to the next, to the next, to the next, you can add up that voltage. That's what they do. So they take all those little cells that are only one-tenth of a volt and stack up thousands of them like, like pennies in a roll and create a powerful battery. And then these sly critters develop a nervous system that sends neurons down to innervate them with different times to conduct the impulses so it doesn't activate this one and then this one and this one and this one. There's a delay built in so they all activate at the same time. And what you get is a powerful shock can be hundreds of volts and a lot of amps of current to stun prey. The bottom fish is even cooler, the stargazer, Astroscopus, took its eye muscles, what are called the extraocular muscles that we use to move our eyes, and modified those into electrical generators like this. And it has a little, little fancy thing on its nose that sticks out like a lure, and a little fish swims up right between. <laughs> it does the eye muscle thing, electrocutes it puts the tongue out and sucks it right in. So nature has all kinds of cool ways to use electricity. And finally, I just want to say, this isn't a real picture. It's supposed to be my oldest daughter, Lauren. When she was a little girl, she wanted to be a marine biologist in the worst way. We were at the beach in the Gulf of Mexico and, uh, near Pensacola, Florida, and she stepped on one of those torpedoes and screamed, and I quote, that's it, I'm not going to be a marine biologist. <laughs> so what happened? She became a lawyer. <laughs> That's it, I'm done. <clears throat> Be glad to answer a couple of questions. And if there's a quick question or two right now, we have just a couple of minutes, I'd be glad to answer them or we could save some for later before we go to the next speaker. Questions? Yes, sir. Uh, quick one. Uh, Use the mic so everybody can hear you. I was just sharing uh, some information out there, but uh, uh, about a week or a week and a half ago, I was listening to a podcast on NPR about how electricity or the uh, effect of electrical movement in the cells affects uh, so many different things. And they were talking about the fact that there was a possibility that it might even relate to the ability to affect the cells so that they don't become cancerous or Absolutely. modify cells enough yeah. so they can... Have, are you guys doing any research on that? Or yeah, what, 
Well, first of all, we have a number of people working on bioelectricity in various forms, mostly as relates to, uh, to nervous system. But to your point, there are all kinds of cool things. For example, bone cells are sensitive to electric fields. So the classic story of the cowboy who gets on the horse and riding like this and develops bow-leggedness. So that's a matter of the stress force on the mechanical uh, bone mineral, mineral tissue to create electric current that flows. And that electric current flow differentially affects what are called osteoblasts and osteoclasts, cells that are building up and tearing down bone that will build it up on the outside and tear it down on the inside. For example, I mean, as one example. There are plenty of examples, and you allude to it, I didn't hear the podcast, but I can imagine, uh, with respect to cells that have become cancerous that are sensitive to electric fields. And so, yeah, I mean, all kinds of cells are sensitive to things with electric fields. One of the, unfortunately, one of the myths that has emerged from some of this in recent years is people have worried a lot about being near power lines and what it's going to do to your brain, et cetera. Well, there's something called the power rule in terms of the power of those things falls off of the square of the distance. And so once you're more than you know a couple feet away from a high tension line, you're not going to get any appreciable power. You have to kind of put your head in between the wires to really get the field. But, but there's a lot of effects in biological systems. Okay, um, why don't we go on to the next talk uh, then, Matt, I think you're up. This is Dr. Matt Weston, who's gonna tell you what happens when things go kind of weird in the brain with electrical activity. I just close this now. Mm -hmm. All right, that was a great introduction, Dr. Friedlander, thanks. Made my job a lot easier. Don't have to explain anything about the basics of <coughs> electricity in the brain. Yes, yeah, but what I'm going to talk about is um, sort of how this electrical activity applies to brain function and brain disease. Um, when, when things, when the electrical signaling gets out of whack, and how can that, that can cause problems, uh, most specifically uh, epileptic seizures. So but the, the foundation for a lot of this is that you know, this, all this electrical signaling uh, that Dr. Friedlander just talked about, it has to exist in a, in a balance, right? So you have to have balanced electrical signaling. So as you get up in the morning, go about your day, meet new people, learn new things, you have to be in the proper balanced electrical state, right? Not too much, not too little. You, know, you need to regulate this on either side. For example, if you, have, you, know, if you want to go home tonight, go to sleep, electrical activity in your brain has to be altered in a way that lets your body go to sleep, right? So you have to you know, bring that electrical activity down a little bit. On the other side of things, you know, if you want to do a task like uh, play a basketball game, give a talk at work, a presentation, you need to be you know, on your toes, electrical activity in your brain has to be ramped up a little bit. So you, you need to be able to, meet, to meet the demands of everyday life by regulating electrical activity in the brain. Now, if you get outside of these, you know, this, this range that you need, bad things can happen. For example, the state of a coma would be a very low electrical activity in the brain to the point where the brain can't be raised to a conscious state. And then on the other hand, too much or ex excessive electrical activity in the brain uh, can lead to epileptic seizures and, and, and even death if that if the seizure goes on long enough and affects certain parts of the brain. Right? Okay, so how do we know that um, you know, epileptic seizures are periods of extreme electrical activity in the brain. Well, that's because we can actually, like, you know, as Dr. Freelander described, we can put wires in cells to, me to measure the uh, electrical potential across the membrane of cells. We can also put wires in the brain to measure electrical activity in the brain. So this is an experiment right here where, an uh, you know, this is the, a brain of an epileptic patient who was having seizures that started in the frontal lobe here. And so what these clinician scientists did was put an electrode in the, in the brain um, to measure the electrical activity. And they could even measure the electrical activity of just a handful of neurons or brain cells. And so you can see this is a trace of electrical activity over time, um, spanning a few minutes, both before, during, and after the seizure. Uh, before the seizure, you have these downward deflections in electricity. And these are these action potentials that we just saw you know, on the, on, <clears throat> on the shorter time scale in the talk before. So the action potentials are, are being fired, as we say, before the seizures at a low rate. But as we start to go into the seizure, the rate of this electrical activity greatly increases to the point that during the, act, during the epileptic seizure, there's a great excess of <clears throat> activity, and it even becomes, you know, positive and negative going to, because it's not just single action potentials, but these 
big currents flowing around the brain. Immediately after the seizure, you have an actually a, a quiet period. So a lot of these processes like maintaining electrical gradients <clears throat> or ionic gradients actually break down. Uh, energy is very low, so there's a period of quiescence. And then over the next few minutes, normal electrical activity in the brain uh, can resume. Um, so this is an experiment or you know, the, done in the clinic to try to understand brain activity in a human patient. Uh, we can also visualize brain activity in the lab um, on a more detailed level. So this is a movie that I'm going to show you. And what we have here is these are, these are neurons or nerve cells that were maintained in the lab. Um, it's a little bit grainy here because of the, how fast you have to make the movie. So this movie is taken at about 30 frames per second. Um, but each one of these is a, is a neuron or a nerve cell, or these little circles. And these neurons have a fluorescent protein in them that gets brighter or dimmer depending on how much electrical activity is going on in that neuron um, at the time. So, so you'll see as the movie goes on, there's electrical activity before the seizure that's low. Now it starts to flash as these, these neurons go into a seizure. And then you get this very intense electrical activity. So as I said, the brightness indicates the amount of elect electrical activity in each cell. And one other thing you can notice is not only is the activity very intense, but it becomes synchronized across different neurons, right? So at, at this point, especially, see, they're all flashing in the same pattern. So um, epileptic seizures are intense electrical activity, but they're also very synchronous activity um, across nearby neurons, and that's what causes um, an epileptic seizure in the brain. So that's what's going on in the brain um, during an epileptic seizure, but you know, what, what can cause a seizure? Um, you know, probably one, uh, roughly one in 10 of us will have an epileptic seizure sometime in our life, or at least a seizure, um, and there can be various causes, but I don't know, any, anyone have an idea of what can cause, cause a seizure? Drugs. Yeah, certainly. Uh, uh, Cocaine, you know, overdose of cocaine can cause a seizure. Cocaine excites the brain, so that pushes you into that state of, you know, too much excitation in the brain can lead to a seizure. Trauma. What's that? Trauma. Yes, trauma. You can get a head injury can lead to a seizure. Um, fever is a common cause of, of seizure in, in children, especially uh, dehydration, because that disrupts the balance of um, these ions or electrolytes in the brain can also cause seizure. If you have one seizure, you're not epileptic. To have epilepsy, you have to have multiple seizures. And these, it can't be a seizure that would be caused by, for example, a cocaine overdose or dehydration. Epilepsy is multiple seizures that do not have an obvious uh, acute cause. Okay, I'll we'll go on to the next one. All right. So, so this is a pie chart of what we understood in the 70s of what caused um, what caused epilepsy, right? And at that time, we could explain about a quarter of, of epilepsies, and they were explained by things such as trauma, head injury, stroke can cause, can cause epilepsy. Uh, tumors in the brain can lead to epilepsy or uh, infections as well. But about three quarters of epilepsy patients, we had no idea what, what caused it. And that's a, this term idiopathic means we don't know what's going on, all right? In the intervening almost 50 years, though, um, because of a lot of human genetic studies, so many of you might know the, the human gen genome's been sequenced. We can now look, you know, throughout the DNA of a human at, you know, base pair by base pair, so letter by letter, and, and sequence the genome. And we can compare healthy people with people who have epilepsies. And from that, we now know that, you know, of these three quarters that were unexplained uh, 50 years ago, the majority of those are caused by genetic mutations or what we also call genetic variants. So that means that you know, uh, can be just a single letter in the DNA that's changed between a healthy person and a person with epilepsy, but that single change is enough to cause um, epilepsy. And, and these can be uh, epilepsies that are sometimes inherited. So sometimes a parent will have a genetic mutation and they have epilepsy and they can pass it on to a child. Um, a lot of those are the milder epilepsies. Um, but <clears throat> some of them actually occur de novo, which means um, they occur randomly, often in the sperm or the egg cell, or even early in the in, in utero development. And so just this, you know, you, you get unlucky, you get a random mutation um, <clears throat> in a gene that does something very important, obviously, and that can cause epilepsy. Um, so what types of genes? So, you know, we know genes are the instructions that tell cells and tell your 
tell your body how to make proteins. So what types of genes would cause epilepsy? Well, well, there's not just one. It's not like there's just one epilepsy gene. Um, there's at least 100 or so different you know, genes that can have these mutations in them that would, would cause epilepsy. Um, they can be in things um, such as cell adhesion molecules. So these are the uh, proteins that help cells stick together. Um, they can be in um, uh, genes that are very important for regulating how the nervous system or the body develops. About the most common one here, which you see accounts for you know, a little over a third of all of these genetic epilepsies are uh, variants or muta mutations in ion channels, right? So we, we, we just heard what ion channels were. So they're you know, gates in the membrane um, of, of all cells, really, but especially nerve cells that allow charged particles such as sodium, um, potassium, calcium, and chloride. Those are the, most, the, the four most common ions um, in the human body. And so the, they're little gates that allow <laughs> these ions to flow from one side to the other of the nerve cell. And they underlie the generation of these nerve impulses or action potentials. Uh, so the mutations then are in the DNA. The DNA are what in, you know, has the instructions that tell the cells how to make these ion channels. So what happens is now we have a normal ion channel, but then we have a mutation, and it's going to make an ion channel that's going to behave differently uh, from a normal ion channel, right? So, <clears throat> so again, we have our DNA, we have our change, ion channel, this is the cell membrane, these little blue things would be the, the, the ions that are flowing from one side to the other, and then this change in one of the base pairs or letters of the DNA causes just a slightly different ion channel to be made. And this ion channel then could let perhaps more ions flow from one side to the other. So in the case of these, for example, sodium ions, right? We learned how sodium ions coming in excite the cells and make them fire these action potentials. Well, if you, now you have an ion channel that's letting too much sodium in, these neurons are going to start to fire too many action potentials, and this can what, <laughs> is what can lead to, you know, to epileptic seizures. So this is actually over here is a graph of how many times uh, a group of channels is opening. So the, the, the C line indicates that the channel is closed. If the O1 means there's one ion channel open, O2, two ion channel open. So a normal channel, you know, if you have a group of probably five or six channels here, you know, most of the time they're all closed. Sometimes you, know, you get one or two, rarely two, opening at once. These ion channels that have mutations in them, however, you can have even four channels open all at one time, and perhaps none of them in this closed state. So this overactive um, <clears throat> ion channels can then lead to, to seizures. Um, but so one of the, you know, th that's interesting from, you know, the basic biology standpoint, so how this is happening in the brain. Um, but another exciting thing um, about this is that we're now able to, or at least trying to, in the process of leveraging this information to actually develop better cures for these epilepsies, which are often very poorly controlled with uh, the current medications that we have. So the idea here would be that you have a patient that comes into the clinic that has epilepsy, you take a DNA <clears throat> sample from that patient, and you sequence their DNA, or at least all of the genes that are, you know, in, that have instructions for making proteins. All right. When you compare that, you know, this this person that has epilepsy's DNA to a, now this large bank of um, genome sequences we have from healthy people, now you can identify, you know, which part of the DNA might be changed that you never see in a healthy person. Um, if that one's in an ion channel, then we can go back into the lab. We can create ion channels now that the normal ion channel, as well as these ion channels that have the mutation in them, right? And we can express these in cells or even in neurons. Um, we can make animal models so that the animal models have the same genetic mutation that the patients have. And then we can use these cells and these animals to, you know, to study the mechanisms of how the epilepsy is starting, as well as to design therapies and test them to see if they can, A, correct the ion channel function, um, and B, stop seizures. And then once these, you know, these could be small molecules, so you could, you know, screen new compounds on, the, on these cells. Um, we can design gene therapies even to go in and try to correct the DNA sequence directly. Um, or what's even you know, a, a faster route is sometimes just looking at existing drugs that we have that treat one thing, but maybe they actually have 
an action on one of these ion channels as well. And then once you identify this, you know, go back, treat the patient, and hopefully uh, stop their seizures. Okay? Um, so seizures, you know, going back to our electrical theme, are these periods of extreme electrical activity in the brain. They disrupt normal brain function, uh, you know, often to the point where patients lose consciousness or can, can't control their, their movement. Um, the genetic variants are now recognized to actually cause the majority of epilepsies. And the largest of these you know, disrupt these ion channels that are regulating the electrical signaling in the brain, the flow of ions from inside to outside neurons, and ultimately how electrically active each one of these neurons is. And that the, the hope is then, you know, on a precision medicine basis um, or on a personalized medicine, you might say, you know, using this genome sequencing to identify these mutations and then modeling them in cells and in the lab, we can go back and design you know, new, new therapies that actually work better than some of the really broad-based therapies that we have now. Um, the, that's all I have, so thanks a lot. And any questions? So from, from diagnosis of seizure disorder to precision therapy, it, how long is that process? And does it vary from person to person, depending um, on the, the etiology of the seizure disorder? Yeah, sure. And so, I mean, I talked mostly about the ion channels are a little bit quicker because we understand how they work. You can easily put them in cells and screen compounds on them. So, you know, something like... The, and, Something like that, especially the really the slowest thing. So if you, like I said, you there's some drugs that you can try that are already approved in humans that can go pretty quickly. You know that could be you know less than a year or something, maybe six months. The problem comes if you have to develop a new drug because it has to go through you know all these regulatory stuff. So that that's really the slowest part of the process. But it, it can actually if, if if it's a repurposed drug, it, it can you know. Genome sequencing analysis, you know, that could take you know, just a matter of, of weeks. And it also kind of depends on how confident you are that that particular mutation is causing epilepsy. There's a lot of, you know, kind of ins and outs of what, when you can make the call that that's actually the cause or not. Um, you know, but then, if, you know, if you just have to, put, if it's an ion channel, you just have to express it in cells. If you could screen drugs that are already there, you know, that could be a matter of months. You know, developing a new drug or a gene therapy, that, that's obviously going to take a lot longer. Yeah. So it's basically medication or drugs that will help alleviate or stop the uh, epilepsy. There is no such thing like for Parkinson's, you have deep brain stimulation. There's no way to... So the, the, there are to the brain and so the traditional you know medicines we have you know most of them are small molecules like a, a drug that goes into the brain but no there are several um, therapies now that are looking more at direct stimulation of the of the brain or inhibition I think you you're going to hear maybe a little bit more in the next talk on that okay, um, but yeah but there's you know we can yeah just like you would do deep brain stimulation for parkinson's there are actually devices now that can be wearable that will detect a seizure and kind of send an electrical current in the brain you know kind of in real time to try to disrupt the seizures you know so that, you know there's a lot um, there's a lot on the horizon in that front as well yeah. thank you thanks Matt. thank you Thank you, Matt. So next up is uh, Dr. Wynn Lagon, and, and Susie gave us a great lead into his talk with looking about putting energy into the brain and really exciting things that could be done. Wynn? I'm glad I planted you in the audience. That was great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, hi, everyone. My name is uh, Wynn Lagon. I'm one of the primary investigators here at FBRI, and I'm going to talk to you today a bit about non-invasive brain stimulation, which we will call NIBS. Um, in certain cases of severe brain dysfunction, um, intervention is warranted. And one way to do this is through brain surgery or deep brain stimulation. And so this is the implantation of an electrode into the brain to change brain electrical activity. And so this is a 
FDA approved technique for certain conditions like severe depression or Parkinsonian tremor or essential tremor. But these surgeries are quite costly and quite risky. And so we ask the question is, is there an alternative to surgery? And so this is what we study is non-invasive ways of brain stimulation. And when we say non-invasive, we mean non-surgical, so not opening up the skull. And there are currently three um, popular or ways of doing this. One is called TMS, which is transcranial magnetic stimulation. This is the use of magnetic fields. One is called TES. This is transcranial electrical stimulation. This is the use of direct electric fields. And the other is TUS, and this is transcranial ultrasound stimulation, which is what my lab primarily studies. And actually, non-invasive brain stimulation has quite a long and ignominious history. So in the early 1800s, they were experimenting with electrical fields to change brain activity. This is some work from Aldini, who was a nephew of Galvani, who was a contemporary of Volta. And they were experimenting with how to change brain activity. A lot of these experiments didn't go too well. <laughs> and one form of non-invasive brain surgery that you might be familiar with um, that has a bit of a history is electroconvulsive therapy, or ECT. And this was the use of very strong electrical fields to induce a seizure in the brain as a way of resetting a dysfunctional brain. But this was also had strong side effects, including loss of memory. And so again, we ask, is there an alternative to these more extreme measures? And so this is where non-invasive brain stimulation may come in. And so we'll talk a little bit about transcranial magnetic stimulation. And this is based on the electromagnetic induction of, um, developed by Faraday. We won't go into the math today. Don't worry about it. <laughs> and so this was invented and first used in humans in, in 1986. And so this is the use of, uh, let me get my pointer here, of putting an electric current through a device which creates a magnetic field which produces an electric field in the head, and that electric field will then go into the brain, and then that electric field will have some effect on the activity of the brain. And we can see here, these are computer models we developed in my lab. This is the outline of a TMS coil, and I put it on someone's head. This is my head. And then this is the electric field that we can generate in the brain. And so where the warm colors are is where the electric field is highest. And depending on where I put the coil, I can change where I put the electric field. And TMS can be quite powerful. I don't know if you saw our demonstration out in the hallway, but this is a little video we made. Here I am, TMSing one of my research assistants, very graciously volunteered. This is a TMS coil on her head. And if you look at her hand, every time I press the button, it stimulates her hand. Because we are producing a lot of electric current in a short amount of time. And as Dr. Friedlander mentioned, the TMS is just a big capacitor that releases a lot of energy in a little amount of time to excite activity in the brain. And TMS actually comes in many forms and is an approved FDA uh, treatment for certain diseases. In this case, this is the machine that's FDA approved to treat depression. He looks happier, doesn't he? <laughs> And interestingly, TMS is also now portable. So this is also an FDA-approved device that is portable. You could put this in your purse, and it's approved for actually migraine with aura. That's what the ad said. You can put it in your purse, and whenever you needed it, you could pull it out and stimulate your own brain. And so TMS is approved for migraine with aura, uh, medication-resistant depression, uh, OCD. It's even approved now for smoking cessation. So there's been a lot of advances recently. Another form of non-invasive brain stimulation is TES, or transcranial electric stimulation. And so instead of passing a magnetic field into your brain, we just want to use an electric field on the surface of the brain. And so you would put two electrodes on the head, which are shown here. And then that electric field, which is a very low electric field, so the electric field of ECT is roughly 800 milliamps, which is not too meaningful to most of us. But this technique is 400 times less than that therapy. So it does not induce a seizure. It's a very low level current. And so when I place an electrode on the head, you can see where I can induce electric fields in the brain.
And so depending on where we put those patches on the head, you can get different electric currents in different areas of the brain. And so you can see we have two large square electrodes, five small electrodes, and there's a lot of work being done on what electrode sizes should we use, where should we put them, depending on where you want the energy to go in the brain as a potential therapy, for example. And so this was some very interesting work done by a colleague of mine at the University of Minnesota, where they did an analysis of 86 different studies investigating when you put electrodes on your head for the effect on working memory. So there were 86 studies studying this. And of these 86 studies, they all used these different montages of electrodes. They've all put them on different areas of the brain because they thought that the current was going here or there. But what happens when you put electric uh, pads on the brain is that the current will go where the anatomy goes. But this study was quite interesting because they um, did an analysis and said this is the, where the electric field is highest that had a positive correlation with an increase in working memory. So if you wanted to improve your working memory, you should put the electrodes on the head that got electric current to this area of the brain. And you can see from these other studies, these guys didn't do too well. They got their current up here. These guys did pretty well. These guys didn't do well. And so this is sometimes why when you see it doesn't work all the time, it's because to get the current where you want it to go is very difficult to do. But what if we want to get electric current deep into the brain? So my lab likes to study an area of the brain called the insula, which is right here. And I've measured it for you. Unfortunately, I'm Canadian, so I did it in metric. So this is five centimeters, which is roughly three inches deep in the brain. And so we did some computer modeling as, can we get TMS deep in the brain? Here's the insula here. Here's TMS. You can see that it's very shallow. Here's TES. Here are the electrodes on the brain. Here's my insula. You just cannot get electric current in these non-invasive methods deep into the brain. Ah, the drama. So <laughs> what are our options? And so we study something new called transcranial ultrasound stimulation. And so this is the ultrasound you're all familiar with. That's common in um, obstetrics for diagnostics. But we change it a little bit. And so we focus it. So this is a transducer, and this is an ultrasound wave coming away from the transducer, and then we can focus it to a very narrow spot. And over here on the right is one of our transducers in a water bath. And if you look at the surface of the water, you can see the ultrasound displacing the water. So it's physically and mechanically moving the water. And so here we have a piece of human skull, and you can see we have a little water on the side, and we can get the ultrasound through the human skull to displace the water. And so now, this is what we do, is instead of using electrical energy, which is what TMS and TES use, we use mechanical energy, because that's what ultrasound is. And so we are physically moving the neurons as a potential new therapy. This is a result from a study we did a few years ago where we wanted to target an area in the middle of the brain called the thalamus. And we have a transducer here on the outside. You can't really see it. But this is the wave propagation into the brain. And so where the areas are or the warm colors, is where we're getting a lot of the focal ultrasound energy. So this is a view of the brain from straight on. And this is the side of the, the, side of the head. And you can see that we can do a very nice small focal spot with ultrasound. So we have very nice spatial resolution. And I mentioned we are interested in this area of the brain called the insula. And so the insula is actually quite an intriguing brain area. So it's been shown to be involved in anxiety and fear it's also hyperactive in chronic pain conditions, and it's also active in certain addiction conditions. And so my lab is looking at using ultrasound to target the insula for potential therapies for these indications. This is one way that we do it. So here's a model of someone's head that we took from an image in a scanner. We figure out where do we put the transducer on the side of the head? Where does that go in the brain? So we can target this area of the insula. And here's a picture of me here with a transducer on the side of my head, and here's my brain. And so we can see where the energy is going in real time while we're doing the experiment with ultrasound. And I thought I'd show you a little data, because that's kind of fun. So this is an activation pattern in your brain when you receive a painful stimulus on your fingertip. And you can see here, this is the insula. This is the area we're interested in. So you get a lot of act activation here. 
And in conditions like chronic pain, this is hyperactive. The insula is very, very active. And so one of our strategies is to use ultrasound to bring that activity down. And so we delivered ultrasound to the insula for 10 minutes. And then these were our results afterwards. I don't know if you can see it, but clearly there's less activity. We actually got a lot of less activity, a lot of less activity. And their perceived pain ratings went down as well. And so these is, this is research we're currently doing in healthy normal volunteers, but we're now starting to move into chronic pain populations. And so the last thing I'd like to mention about focus ultrasound is the use of not just a single element that I showed you, but the use of a lot of elements. And so this is a system called uh, um, an exablate system that we have here at the FBRI. And so this is a system that's paired with an MRI scanner, which is shown here. And this is a helmet here that has a whole lot of transducers that will all focus into one spot in the brain, right here. And it's shown here. And you can see here's a patient in the MR scanner up here. And so I'd like to show you a video of this is a gentleman with a central tremor. And this is um, before this surgery. And you can see essential tremor is a very debilitating disease. Um, its quality of life is severely impaired. It's difficult to write. It's difficult to drink. Um, it would be difficult to drive. You can see he's got this frame on his head because he's going to go into the scanner. And then this is this gentleman about two hours later. And so this is quite amazing. So focus ultrasound has turned brain surgery into day surgery, and you don't have to open up the skull. And so we're really excited to get this going here at FBRI as well. So these are the one, one, of, the thing, one of the areas of interest here that, that my lab works in. And so I'd just like to sum up that we think that non-invasive brain stimulation has a lot of different applications than the ones I've talked about, as well as many others that you can focus it to different brain areas, either shallow or deep, to change uh, brain activity. And thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Wayne. <clears throat> Time for a question or two? Yep. Oh, go ahead and let her go first. She has the microphone. Go ahead. When you do that, how long does the after effect last? For the, the for the focused um... in the in the tremor case, mm -hmm. so the first the first case to do um, uh, tremor ablation was in 2013. So we're now coming up on 10 years, and so the 10 year data is coming out. But there are some patients who now have it. Um, it's lasted for over five years, and in some patients it doesn't last as long. And so there's there's reasons for this that we could talk about in more detail. But some patients are more responsive, or the lesion they produced was bigger or smaller in some. In some patients, it's more or less effective. But there is evidence that in some patients, it's lasted out to five years. And we expect maybe some patients out to 10 years with the new data. Other questions? Yeah. If you bring the mic over. OK, we'll come back in a second. Mike. Mike to Mike. With the focusing of the ultrasound to one spot, is there any heat generated that would possibly create side effects? Yes, so that surgery that I showed you, that is a thermal mechanism. They are purposeful, purposefully inducing heat to create the lesion. The things that I do in my lab that are low intensity, you're right, are subthermal. Good, great question, thank you. Question in the back. Uh, what's the etiology of essential tremor? Yeah, that's a good question. So they focus it on the specific area, this uh, nucleus in the thalamus that is dysfunctional, it, sh it shows altered brain rhythms. And so their solution was to just get rid of it. So that surgery I showed you, that's an ablative surgery. So they create a very focal lesion in that area of the thalamus, and that works. Other than that, the, e the exact etiology of tremor is not exactly known. Other questions? Uh, one more. So if it stops working after three or five years, can you have it done again? And another great question. I think they are trying to understand that. And so the one thing I didn't mention was this surgery, when it was first started, was only approved to do it on one side of the brain. So if you had tremor in both limbs, you had to choose which one you wanted fixed. You usually take your dominant limb. But now it is approved for both limbs, so they've overcome some of the side effects. 
but I don't have an exact answer for you if a patient can come back and get it again. I don't know that yet. Okay, one, one last question here before we move on. But. Is this strictly a research therapy, or is it a um, that, wide, widespread? That is an FDA-approved therapy now, and it's re reimbursable. So yeah. <laughs> CMS improves reimbursing it as well. Okay, thanks very much, Wayne. You're welcome. Okay, our next and final presentation will be from Dr. Sujith Vijayana. Sujith, I believe, is teaching in Blacksburg tonight, so he's going to deliver his presentation remotely to us by Zoom. Sujith, I believe you're on. Is that correct? Yes. I'm here. Sorry. <laughs> um, Maybe not. Can you see me? Um, I, yes, we see you. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yeah. All right, man, you got your faces covering the screen. We can see every hair, every blemish, beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> so you're up, uh, Sujith, your turn, go right ahead. Okay, I need to share my screen here, hold on. Uh, which screen are you got? Hold on, what? We're not receiving, we're not receiving your shared screen yet, Suja. Okay. Here we go, here we go. Yep, go into presenter mode. Is that right, do you guys see it now? Yeah, we need to, um, if you can drag, oh, oh, there you go, we got it. Yep, you're good to go, fire away. Okay, so um, today I'm gonna talk to you about uh, rhythms of the sleeping brain. And in particular, I'm gonna talk about how these rhythms are important for learning and memory during sleep. So it turns out sleep confers a special benefit to memory consolidation. So let me tell you what I mean by that by example. So I could teach you something in the morning and then uh, eight to 10 hours later, I could retest you on it. Or I could teach you something right before you go to sleep and then retest you on it eight to 10 hours later after you awaken. And it turns out on a whole host of tasks, you do much better if you sleep during the intervening eight to 10 hours. So there's something special going on uh, during sleep um, in the brain with respect to learning and memory. So what's equally cool is during sleep, either via electrical stimulation or, or by the present covert presentation of task-related cues, I can further enhance the sleep related memory uh, benefits uh, sleep-related benefits of learning and memory. So for example, if you were learning something and there was you were listening to some music, or if there was a particular odor, I could present those odors or I could present uh, the sounds you were listening to covertly during sleep. And you'll, do, you'll do even better on the task um, or uh, whatever you were learning. So that it further enhances uh, the benefits of sleep. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that, but first I need to give you a little bit of background about sleep. So this is uh, what's called a hypnogram. So that's just a fancy word for the stages of sleep as a function uh, of time over the course of a night's sleep. So on the y-axis here, we have um, stage W, which is wake, and R, which stands for REM, rapid eye movement sleep. That's when you, you have your vivid uh, dreams and stage N1, N2, and N3, which are the periods of non-REM sleep, okay? And so just as a factoid, Hypnogram, uh, the word is derived from the, the Greek god of sleep, hypnos, okay? And all I want you to notice here is at the beginning half of the sleep, uh, of a night's sleep, you have a lot more of N3 sleep or slow wave sleep. People like to call this recuperative sleep. And during the second half of the night's sleep, you have a lot more REM sleep where you have your vivid dreams, okay? And so how do we come up with this hypnogram? We come up with this hypnogram by using EEG, which measures brain activity, EOG, which measures um, eye movements, and EMG, which measures muscle tone, okay? And here we have various uh, EEGs at various levels of arousal. So when you're awake, the EEG is relatively irregular and of low voltage. So just look at the amplitude here, relatively low amplitude. But as you get drowsy, you start getting these alpha waves, which are these eight to 12 Hertz oscillations in the back of the head. And then as you go, 
into uh, light N1 sleep, you get theta waves, which are slightly slower brain rhythms, let's say four to eight, about four to eight hertz. They're used slightly uh, of higher amplitude. And then when you go into N2 sleep, you get what are called sleep spindles and K complexes, which aren't shown here. And during N3 sleep or slow wave sleep, you get these slow oscillations, okay? Which depending on the lab can be anywhere from 0.1 to four hertz, but they're very slow and of very high amplitude, okay? And then when you go into rapid eye movement sleep, when you have your dreams, the EEG becomes relatively irregular and flat. In fact, it looks a lot more like the awake uh, EEG than the non-REM uh, sleep EEG traces. And that's why people uh, call REM sleep paradoxical sleep, because when you look at the brain activity, it looks like when you're awake, okay? So I'm gonna actually tell you a lot about uh, non-REM sleep, okay? My lab actually has a focus on REM sleep, but we do do non-REM sleep. And Today, I'm gonna, in the interest of time, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about non-REM sleep and its role in learning and memory. So um, in order to do that first, I need to tell you a little bit about this person named HM. So um, HM had epilepsy, okay, that um, could not be medically treated. So he had both of these hippocampi, these green structures here removed, okay? And the hippocampus is really important for memory. So he had these two removed. And so what happened was, is he could no longer make any new memories after the surgery, but he could remember stuff from his prior to the surgery. So for example, he could remember the names of his childhood friends. He could draw a very accurate map of the city he lived in when he grew up. And the idea is, is that the hippocampus, okay, serves as a short-term storage for memory. And those memories are transferred to the neocortex for long-term storage. So HM, remembered his childhood memories because they'd already been transferred to the neocortex, but he couldn't form new memories because he didn't have hippocampus. So if you've seen the movie Memento, HM is kind of like the guy in Memento, okay? And it's thought that this transfer of memories from the hippocampus to the neocortex happens during non-REM sleep, and that this transfer is made mediated by these brain waves, these very fast rhythms, brain waves in the hippocampus called ripples, interacting with these very slow neocortical slow oscillations, appropriately named, and sleep spindles, which are about 11 to 16 hertz oscillations. The prevalence of these oscillations are related to memory improvement, and the impairment of these oscillations have been related to memory impairment, okay? So now I wanna tell you a little bit about those uh, studies related to how can we enhance memories by covertly presenting task-related cues? So in this task, subjects had to remember, uh, we're playing the matching game. They had to remember where pairs of objects were located on a grid, okay? And while they were learning this task, an odor was played. In fact, it presented, an odor was present, and the odor was that of a rose. And then when half of the subjects slept, for half of the subjects, when they slept, the odor was presented during slow wave sleep. And for the other half, the odor wasn't presented. And then when, when they were retested in the morning, Okay, those subjects that the odor were present was presented to remembered the task, did, remembered the, where the pairs of objects were located much better than the ones that did not receive an odor, okay? And interestingly enough, in the same study, they showed when these odors are presented during, hippocamp uh, during sleep, the hippocampus is activated, right? That structure that I said is really important for transferring memories, uh, for consolidating memories during non-REM sleep. Now you can, do this not just with odors, you can also do this with sounds, okay? So what you can do is you can present subjects with objects and you compare sounds with those objects. So when they see the cat, they hear a meow. When they see a kettle, they hear a whistle. And then you can take a subset of those sounds and play them during sleep. So for example, if play the meow sound, but not the whistle sound. So when they wake, when you retest them, they tend to remember those sounds that were play objects associated with those sounds that were played during sleep better than the ones that they, were not played. So for example, they might remember if the cat sound was uh, played during sleep, they would might remember where the cat is located much better than where the cattle was located. Okay. So what's going on? What might be going on? Why is it that when we replay these task related sounds that we can remember things better? Well, for the, that, I'm going to turn to the rodent literature. In fact, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the rodent hippocampus. Okay. In the rodent hippocampus, there are these special cells that are active when a rat is in a particular location on a track. So when the rat is here, 
place cell four might fire, will fire here. When the rat is here, place cell two will fire here. When the rat is here, place cell three will fire, okay? So the cell fires a particular location in the environment. So here is just a graph of the cells, the activity of cells as a uh, rat is traversing the track. So you can think of zero as the beginning of the track. You can think of 275 as being centimeters as being the end of the track. And this is a sequence of activation of cells as the rat runs from one side of the track to the other. So then you can do this really cool thing. So before the rat runs uh, on, the, on the track, you can have the rat sleep, okay? And then, um, and then you can have the rat run the track. And then after it runs the track, you can have it sleep again. And then you can ask the qu following question, right? You can ask, is the sequence of cell firing more prevalent in sleep after the task than before the task, okay? And researchers asked that question, they found exact that to be the case. So these, this sequence of cells are essentially replayed during subsequent sleep, okay? So the activities of the day are being replayed during sleep. And in fact, what's really cool, it's being replayed about 15 to 20 times faster. So it's like you're watching a movie, but you're watching it 15 to 20 times faster. And they, that this, the replay of these cells, these replay of these events of the day, okay, occur during those special oscillations I told you about in the hippocampus called the ripples, okay? And so what other researchers did was they had rats run either to the right or to the left. And when the rat ran to the right, sound A was played. And when the rat ran to the left, sound B was played. And you can imagine there's a different sequence of cells that are active when the rat's running to the right as opposed to when it's running to the left. And so when they played A, sound A, the cells associated with the right side of the track were reactivated. When they played sound B, the cells of the left side of the track were reactivated. So what it's suggesting is when we're presenting these task-related cues and sounds, okay, the memory associated, for example, with sound A is being replayed and, and being consolidated, okay? So I just now wanna just tell you a little bit about what my lab is doing related to this. So it turns out it was thought that these sleep spindles, okay, were global, meaning that they occurred over the entire brain at the same time. But recently it's been shown that these spindles can occur in little pockets, okay, in the brain. So they can be local. So we wanna know what's the role of local spindles in learning and memory. Do local spindles consolidate some small component of the memory and then global spindles form a unified uh, precept of the memory? So in order to do this, we have a collaboration with neurosurgeon at, uh, neurosurgeons and clinicians at Carilion, which allow us uh, to look at brain activity in patients that are undergoing invasive, invasive monitoring to identify the focus of their epileptic seizures. So we're able to look at hippocampal ripples and neocortical spindles um, at the same time, okay? And what we do is we play, we do this, we do a task like this that I told you about before, where a person has to remember where an object is located on a grid and a sound is played, okay? And so what we do is we look at the activity that ensues when we covertly play these sounds during sleep. The idea is that when we play that sound, for example, if it's of the cat, the memory related to the cat is, play, is being reactivated. And then we can look at the brain activity during that time and see what's the role of local spindles in consolidating memories, right? What's the role of global spindles in consolidating memories? So that's one of the things that my lab is trying to do. Now I talked, told you about that task-related sounds uh, can enhance uh, the learning and memory benefits of sleep. But what I didn't tell you is, is that even non-task-related stimuli can enhance the learning and memory benefits of sleep. So it turns out, so in this study, what they did is they took the, the slow oscillations, right? The ones occurring on the neocortex, they found the trough of it and they stimulated noise at the peak. So they watched, the, they were observing the sleeping person's brain, okay? And when they saw, they identified the, the trough of the slow oscillation, when they got to the peak, they stimulated, okay? And when they do this, what happens is the slow oscillation gets enhanced. The slow oscillation gets enhanced and memory consolidation gets enhanced, okay? So not only that, it can actually increase the coupling of spindles or the co-occurrence of spindles and slow oscillations which are also thought to be really important for uh, memory consolidation. So another thing my lab is interested in is you can imagine there are many different oscillations, as I've told you about, that are important for sleep uh, related to learning and memory with respect to sleep. So you might imagine that it would be useful to potentially enhance um, 
various sleep rhythms, depending on what your desire is, uh, desired end goal is, or in diseases where these rhythms go awry, you may wanna play sounds to correct them, okay? So we're really interested in figuring out what's the optimal sound to correct a sound, uh, correct uh, to either enhance a rhythm or reintroduce a rhythm in a uh, disease state to either enhance learning or ameliorate the symptoms of a disease, right? So an example here in my lab is that we try to look at diseases. We use sleep as a window into diseases. We figure out what the rhythm looks like in health and we figure out what it looks like in disease. And it turns out they're aberrant in a whole host of diseases, for example, Parkinson's disease, schizophrenia, and post-traumatic stress disorder. And then once we identify the aberration, we want to try to use non-invasive sound therapy to try to correct those and ameliorate the symptoms of disease. So I'll give you a quick example. One, one is that we're working on Parkinson's disease. So it turns out patients with Parkinson's disease have degradation of motor learning processes and they have poor adaptation and gradual motor loss, okay? And it turns out that sleep spindle coupling to slow oscillations are really important for motor learning, right? So as I told you before, if you stimulate with sounds, you can increase the uh, coupling of slow oscillations and spindles. And so some other labs have shown their aberrant sleep rhythms in Parkinson's disease. And our lab has, show, has some preliminary data showing that the coupling of these spindles and slow oscillations are aberrant in Parkinson's disease patients. So potentially we could stimulate with sound, increase slow waves, and increase the coupling and improve motor learning deficits in Parkinson's patients. But one last thing, sleep isn't just important for learning and memory. It turns out it's important for immune function. It turns out when you're in slow wave sleep, the vessels open up, okay? And it clears out plaques, okay? So in, we could actually potentially impede the progression of Parkinson's disease by enhancing uh, slow wave. So we could improve motor learning and we could probably potentially impede uh, progression of Parkinson's disease. In fact, it's been shown in a study of 129 Parkinson's patients, the less slow wave sleep that they have, the quicker the degradation of their motor skills. So I think I've gone over time. So I'll end there with just a slide of the overall theme of my lab. Hello? Yeah, thanks. Thanks oh, very much, Sujith. Did I run I'm over here. time or no? What's that? Did I run over time or do I? Yeah. No, you're good. You're good. Uh, yeah. Let's see if there are any questions in the audience first. Uh, uh, questions? Sujith. If not, I'm, I'm going to start and I'll go to the other ones. Um, Sujith, I know this is not easy, but what about internally generating the stimuli like a sound, like you dream of, you know, a, a symphony or, or something, or you dream of an odor by conjuring up internally the stimuli that don't have a real physical at the time <clears throat> activation of circuits, is there any chance that coupling with the oscillation can lead to the same type of effects? So I, I guess your idea is, can we, instead of playing an external sound, can the person internally generate that? Is that yes. Like, so I, you know, there are some studies where people are looking at lucid dreaming. So where they're able to kind of indicate what's going, that they're dreaming. So I could potentially ima imagine that they may be able to, uh, if they're instructed, when they're aware that they're lucid dreaming to internally play those sounds. Now, what kind of coupling and what kind of effects that would have, that would be diff that would be speculation, but that's an interesting idea for sure. All right, thanks. We have some questions from the audience. Go ahead, hopefully you can hear. Uh, based on your first slide, uh, am I to conclude that if you try to stay up all night to study for a test, you're less likely to do well than if you Study, go to sleep, and then take the test. Well, <laughs> I get these kind of questions from my students all the time, right? So it depends, right? Like, uh, so I guess it depends on how much of the material we already know. I, let me rephrase it this way: I think if you learn the material and you over time and you and and you you know you sleep, it's going to help you consolidate it better, right? So I guess that one's a little tricky because if you have like a hundred pages to learn and you learn three pages <laughs> and then you go to sleep, you're probably gonna remember those three pages better. But now if you cram for a hundred pages overnight and the exam's over the whole hundred, uh, then you might actually do better, right? Because you actually looked at the other 97 pages. That's a little tricky to answer. <laughs> Is that right, fair? Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Sujit. Uh, we have another question from the audience. Um, 
So how long would a therapeutic um, change, how long would it take for the therapeutic change to take place in um, either the um, disruption of the disease or the uh, impairment, um, the improvement of the motor skill? That, that's a good question. That's something we would like to ultimately test, but I can tell you that there's, I can tell you in other contexts. Uh, so for example, schizophrenics have uh, these sleep spindles I were telling you about. They're less coordinated and um, synchronized uh, in schizophrenics. And uh, there, there are drugs you can take that act on the thalamus that will kind of make them more coordinated. And so those people, you know, in a few days when they do tests on, on memories, they can see differences. Whether the Parkinson's patients, how long it would take um, to actually see a benefit is an open question. I would say I don't have an answer. I don't have a, I don't have a, a clear answer to that. That's something we'd actually have to test out. Okay, thank you, Sujit. I think that's all the questions. So please join me in thanking Sujit again very much. Appreciate it. And uh, thanks to all the speakers and thanks to all of you. Uh, that wraps up the lecture part of the program. For those who are interested, we're going to have a little tour of some of the very things you saw here uh, assembling out in the lobby in about five minutes for those who are interested. Brothers, thanks for coming out. We certainly enjoyed having you. Enjoy Brain Week and be aware of your brain. Okay. Thank you.